we assemble to worship our Lord, that's exactly what we are doing. We are offering to Him our worship because of who He is. Whether that be in, in the partaking of the Lord's Supper as we commemorate the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus the Christ. Whether that be in, in giving of our means as you and I give back to God in the same fashion in which He gives to us. Whether that be when we come boldly before the throne of God in prayer, make our petitions, our desires, hopes and fears, make those known to the Father. Whether it be in a, a study of, of God's Word that can enrich our lives and, and help us live more faithfully and closer to that cross, or if it is in singing. If it is that we raise our voice to God, We do these things in worship because of who God is. Not because of what my voice sounds like and it's bad or it's good or it's mediocre. Not in hopes that uh, I will be discovered and be the next greatest thing in, well, in my mind, I would say Motown. I don't know if I should say Motown or Nashville depending on which style of music you like. The point of all five acts of worship are to exalt God, not me. And so the question comes up and is asked this. I enjoy music in my church. I feel it brings me closer to God. And the question is, What's so wrong with a praise band? I'd like for you to grab your Bible. I'll try to find mine. And we're going to turn to John chapter 4. And before we can think even to begin with music, we really need to start at the well. The well that uh, was dug for those Samaritan people so many years ago. As a matter of fact, in John chapter 4, verse number 4, at least in my mind and, and written by my hand in my Bible, my copy of my Bible, John chapter 4 and verse number 4 is the key. Jesus makes a statement there to His disciples that He shimmies off. And here is the statement. For He must needs go through Samaria. That's not the common practice of the Jewish person in Jesus' day. The common practice for the Jewish person in Jesus' day is to avoid Samaria at all costs, walk all the way around it so that I don't have to breathe the same air as the dirty Samaritans. I don't have to see with my righteous eye the dirty Samaritan. I don't even have to think about them because I'll be so far away from their city, I won't have to think about them. And Jesus' statement that he makes, I must need or he must needs go through Samaria, points to us to show us the heart that Jesus is going to have not only for a woman, which was a no-no in the day. Not only a Samaritan, which was out of bounds for that time. But what we'll find through this conversation is that he's going to speak to a Samaritan woman who has a questionable past in her marriage. When she comes on the scene, he is sitting down by the well. There's speculation of which well and exactly which well it is. And for clarity's sake, let me first start out by saying, I don't know exactly which well it was. I have a pretty good idea, but I don't know exactly which well. The presumption is there is a well that is accessible and, and actually the person descends further down into the, the body of the well to get further down to where the water is. 
Uh, they can bring up larger buckets of water for animals. And they can put those in the troughs that are there. Th those animals can, can uh, rehydrate themselves. And men and women there can rehydrate themselves. Everyone from Samaria or everybody at least from that side of Samaria comes out to that well and gets their water. Would you like to know why that is? Because they don't live in 2020. They can't just go to their kitchen. You know, they have to carry that water back. As he's sitting there, she walks up to the well. And, and she said, or rather, he says to her, Give me something to drink. I can imagine in my mind that when he begins to audibly speak to her, that she jumps. One of my favorite things to do that I get scolded for very often in my house is I like to walk quietly through my house till I'm right behind you and say, Hey! I like to see them jump like that, just kicks and giggles, I guess. But as he speaks to her, I could see her not expecting him to say a word, and as he said, give me something to drink, I almost say, what, what, what? Who, who are you talking to? Why are you, as a Jewish man, speaking to me as a Samaritan woman? There are some barriers there. Jews don't deal with Samaritans. Not at all. Men don't speak to women in public in Jesus' day. Even if my lovely bride were to say something to me in that day, I'm speak back to her. We'll handle that when we get home. Now, I'm reporting history. I'm not telling you how it runs at our house. As he speaks to her, her question is, why are you speaking to me? His answer is this. If you knew who was speaking to you, you'd, you'd say to me, give me water. Give me the water of life where I'll never be thirsty again. Now, automatically in her mind, here's what she thinks. If I can get water where I am never thirsty again, I have checked off for eternity a daily chore, or at least an every other day chore, of getting physical water. Is that what Jesus had in mind? <laughs> Not a bit. But that's what she had in mind. Notice what he's doing. He is using something that is at least seen as beneficial to her in a way to pique her interest and to have her to continue to speak. They go through this particular monologue or, or uh, rather dialogue, speaking back and forth to each other. And at one point, Jesus says, why don't you go run on home and get your husband? Now, here's the problem. Because what she says is true, but it's not honest. It is true that the one, uh, that, that she doesn't have a husband, but Jesus fills out the rest of that history for us. He says, you said very well you don't have a husband. Matter of fact, you've had, you've had five, and this one that you're with, he's not your husband. Whoa. That went a little deeper than we wanted it to, Jesus. What's he doing? He hadn't, he, there's a phrase we use back home. Let me see if you guys know it. She didn't know him from Adam's house cat. Y'all know that one? All right. Now, she didn't know him from anybody. And he is telling her about very sensitive things in her life, even in that day. He is beginning the process of proving who he is to her. And so you and I pick up in verse number 19, where she said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. You think? He's already told you about your life. He's told you about all kinds of things. You perceive he's a prophet. So she says... 
Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. All right, let's answer this question for us since Jesus did not. Were the Samaritans supposed to go to Jerusalem? Some shaking yes, some shaking no, others looking at me dumbfounded. Was, were the Jewish, were the Samaritans supposed to go to Jerusalem? Let me ask you a question. If Sunday we said to you lovely ladies, you can come to the building. But you can't come into the building. We're going to let you stand out on the carport area out there. And we'll open the doors for you. Let you hear. Would you do that? Don't shake your head. Don't nod. I know the look is, uh, is that what's going to happen? No. The distribution of people in the temple worship is interesting. Within the, the temple itself are Jews. By Jews, I mean Jewish men. And then out there in the breezeway, not in here in the air conditioning, out there where it gets warm, is the court of the women and Gentiles. Now where do you think a Samaritan's going to be? He's half Jew half Gentile. Let's suppose that it's a Samaritan man. Let me tell you where he's going to be. He's going to be out there sweating. You know why? He's not a Jew. And you say, yeah, but he's half Jew. Listen to me. He is not a Jew. He is considered full-on Gentile. And so he's out there. And her question is, if we come over to Jerusalem and worship, we have to be treated like second-class citizens. Why can't we come into the temple? What's wrong with us? If you think about the question asked from the woman at the well, it's not a bad question. And the best answer I can give you on why there was a separation that way is because God said there was going to be a separation that way. You know what, he, what Jesus does not do here? He doesn't pick a fight with her with where she's supposed to worship. Matter of fact, he takes that question of are we supposed to worship here or there and he turns it sideways. And here's what he says. Woman, this is verse 21, believe me, the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain nor at Jerusalem worship your father. There's coming a time, Jesus would say, where it doesn't matter where you are. You could be in Samaria, worship God. You could be in Damascus and worship God. You could be in Jerusalem and worship God. You could be in Munford, Alabama or Hot Springs, Arkansas. And worship God. Notice what he said though. The hour is, the hour cometh with an E-T-H. It is, it's fast approaching. Which means it ain't there yet. We look at it in our rearview mirror and see that it has come. He said, you worship what you know not. And we worship what we know for the salvation is of the Jews. So, you can only be saved if you're a Jew, right? If that's the case, would you like to tell me about Rahab? Ruth? By the way, Ruth had a couple of very famous children and grandchildren. I don't know if you know this or not. One by the name of Jesse and David. Yeah, they're pretty, pretty famous from the Bible. That was from a mother who was a Moabite.
He said that you worship whatever, what you don't even know. Salvation comes from the Jews. He wasn't talking anything about a temple. He wasn't talking anything about geography. He was talking about the one who's sitting at that well. The Messiah from Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, all the way through, even through the life of Jesus the Christ, was promised to come through the line, the family line of Abraham and the family of David. That was a promise. And he said, once again, salvation for the world is coming through the Jewish line. Obviously it is. Why? Because Jesus is a Jew. It goes on in verse 23, But the hour cometh, and now is, that when true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. And then he goes to verse number 24, which is very commonplace for us, where it says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, why do we start singing at a well? It deals with attitude and action. See, in John 4 and verse 24, Jesus summarizes this statement to her by saying, God the Spirit and they that worship Him must Underline that if you underline in your Bible, must, M-U-S-T. It's not a, I hope they will. It's not a, they ought to. It's not a, if one was wise, they would. This is a M-U-S-T. And without that must, neither one of those things would be correct. That I must worship Him in spirit and in truth. That is, first with the proper attitude. Number one, if I must worship God with the proper attitude and the proper actions, the proper ones that are sanctioned by God, then I need to know that I can do all five acts of worship that are prescribed to God's children in this book right here and do it with the wrong attitude and not worship, period. Then again, I can have the greatest attitude of submission and worship and not do those five actions and not worship God. Those two things are mutually inclusive because, I'm going to use this little pointer, because of that word right there. They that worship God must worship God in spirit and... If you write in your Bible, once again, circle the word and. And in truth. And... How many of you like words? Nobody. Good. <laughs> and is a correlating conjunction found in the English language. It's also a common correlating conjunction found in the Greek language. It means, and, uh, means everything before that word holds the same value as everything after that word. It's just as important attitude-wise as it is action-wise and vice versa. And so when God says, they that worship me what must worship me in spirit and in truth, those things both have to be there with me giving 100% of everything that I have in order to worship my God. How did y'all let me get that far off on just a woman at a well? It all deals with authority. How do you worship? First, let, let's define worship. Not everything that the Christian does in life is worship. Shake or nod. Shake this way. Here's the very basest example of that. Are you ready? When a Christian needs to go to relieve his bodily function, is he worshiping God? Not everything in my life is worship, but everything in my life is service. You see the difference there? 
So when I come to worship God, I assemble with those saints and I ask myself how, when, why, who, where, all those questions about worship. How do you worship? How do you do it? Do, do you worship by following what God would, would say within His Scripture or do you worship by what you would like to do? Sometimes, unfortunately, we answer the question, how do you worship by saying, I don't know, we just do the same thing that we've always done. And if, if we, God forbid, the song leader sings four songs before the Lord's Supper and not three, that'll throw all everything off, right? How do you worship? When do you worship? Any day, every day? Once a week, once a month, once a year, when do we worship? How often, why, where? All of these things are found within God's Word. How we do those things, why we do those things, all found within God's Word. And it's necessary you and I know what God expects. When you and I read about that first century church and we see them gathering on the first day of the week, we see a divine example of when, don't we? When we see them doing those five acts of worship that are found in Acts chapter 42 and verse number 47 also, and throughout the entirety of the book of Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, you may keep going. We find a divine example of what the church is supposed to do. When we see how often they came together or why they came together, we see divine examples of what the church is supposed to do. Now, Let's look at this idea. Did God create people? Did, I promise you this is not a trick question. Yes. <laughs> yes, God created people. Day number six, he created them with the beast of the field and everything that would be creeping upon this earth. When God created man, did he realize the frailty of man's body, that man could get sick? That man could uh, break bones, that, that man could uh, have a point in time to where on a prescribed day of worship, he might not be able to go. Yes. And so, sometimes there are reasons that we miss. Sometimes there are, sometimes we are in the hospital and the doctor, no matter how much you beg them, won't let you go. Not even for an hour or two. I tried it. But there is a distinctive difference, and we need to understand this. There is a distinctive difference between reason and excuse. And the difference between reason and excuse deals with the authority that I perceive in worship. Now, we're getting to answering the question, but we're dealing with authority. So, here's the difference. If I am my authority in worship, any excuse will do. Mark Twain once wrote, or it was said about him that he had a friend come by his house and ask him if he could borrow an axe. And uh, Mark Twain said he had to go inside and take a nap. And the friend said, what does that have to do with anything? And he said, one of his excuses is, is as good as another, right? See, the things sometimes we find as excuses that keep us from assembling with the saints would not be the same reasons why we would not go to work on Monday. I think I think it will be in March this year where I will hold a gospel meeting somewhere in Missouri. I don't know where the place is. I was speaking to a friend about this earlier and he said, "You know that's right in the middle of your senior daughter's softball season." God's more important than softball. 
I'll catch you the week after. Is there a difference between a reason and an excuse? And we're going to have to find out what the difference is so that when we gather together, our worship will be accepted by God. That's what we want, isn't it? Shake or nod. Is that what we want? Yeah, then our, our worship that needs to be accepted by God has to be underneath the right authority, with the right attitude, with the right actions. Get off this preacher, let's go to another one. Okay. Look at this question. Now, this is what I read the second time I read this question because the second time I began to read inflection into it. You know, I really enjoy music in my church. I feel it brings me closer to God. What's wrong with the praise band? Well, I'd like to start out in a smart aleck answer asking them, when did you die for the church that you have? What about what God wants? When I worship God, what about what God wants in worship? You know what worship is not about? It's not about you or me. It's not about if you like it or you want to do it or you think it's this or you think it's that. Who cares what you think? Read through the book of Job and have God ask you the same questions he asked Job from chapter 38 through chapter 41. Where were you when I was doing this? Where were you when I was doing that? Where was the point where God was, was contemplating having a church and having his son die and say, you know, we should really check in with Billy and see what he thinks. What about what God wants? Can, can God, the creator of the world, get what he wants in worship to him? Check your head this way. That's the only way he's going to get worship unto him, by the method that he prescribes. Now, Look at these nine verses. We're going to have to go through this fast. Time, as they would say, is not on our side. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 30, when they had sung a hymn, they went out over the Mount of Olives. Mark chapter 14 and verse 26, when they had sung a hymn, they went out over the Mount of Olives. Acts chapter 16 and verse number 25, while Paul and Silas were in prison, they sang songs at midnight, sang songs and prayed. Romans chapter 15 and verse number 16, sing. 1 Corinthians 14, 15, sing with understanding and sing with my heart also. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19, singing and making melody in your heart. Colossians 3 and verse 16, singing and praising God. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 12, singing in the midst of the congregation. James chapter 5, 13, is anyone married? Let him sing psalms. Where, where is it where it says sing and play? Let's go back a slide. You see it yet? You see, sing and play. Sung, sung, sang, sing, sing, sing. Singing, singing, sing, sing. Where is play? It's very conspicuous that it's missing. Either God does not know how to tell us what He wants, or just maybe He doesn't want it. I know of people, and you know of people, who have fantastic musical abilities. I know of people who are known on different continents for their musical ability. And they're really good. So, you know what? I know folks who are so far superior to anything I can think of mechanically that I shudder when I get into their shadow. That's how good they are. They can tell you things more than I can about a combustible engine, like that something else happens other than putting gas in it and doing that. But that's the limit of my scope of a combustion engine. 
if that's the case, Sunday, can we, can we roll a car in here and rebuild a carburetor in order to praise God? Well, we ought to be able to. That's what we want to do. As absurd as that argument is, so is the argument of playing along with singing. When God says sing, the law of exclusions says, I have taken away everything else. But I, can, I don't care. The prescription was singing and singing only. As a matter of fact, the word ado, the first one you see there, is translated in the sing and its other verb forms uh, for the past two slides here. Sing and sang and sing and singing. There's only one other word, and that word is making melody. That's Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19. That word is solo. That is a musical term meaning to pluck. Uh-oh. Now we've got a problem, right? Well, you know what the most common musical instrument in the religious world in America is today? The piano. If... This making melody solo in Ephesians 5.19 is to pluck. You still can't use a piano. In case you didn't know, a piano is a percussion instrument as it has a hammer hit a string. It doesn't pluck it. So even that piano is out. But even better than that, the word solo in the Greek language has always had and has never failed to have, every time it has been used, has never failed to mention the instrument when it mentions that word solo. Singing and making melody. You want to hear the instrument? In our hearts. You ever had a moment with a child, or perhaps your mother or father or grandmother or grandfather, that plucked at your heartstrings? then you know what solo is. And that idea when we're singing, we're also making melody with our heart, but we're supposed to be pouring out all of our emotion to God. So, if you look at Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 19, and you read that word correctly, there Paul would write, by the inspiration of God, we should be singing, but we should be singing with everything that we have, with a little bit of gusto and fervor and zeal. That's another one for another day, though, isn't it? Well, let me say this to all of you who are here and all of you who are online. Number one, I love listening to music. I love listening to all kinds of music. I can go from 60s and 70s music on my iPod to 90s music to today's music to classical music in, in the stroke of a button. I like all of it. Like everything about music. I like to play music. I like hearing others who play music and play music well. I love learning new songs. I love music. But I love God more. And just because I can play an instrument, does not mean I have the right. So let's go to answer the question. So what's wrong with the praise band? Number one, praise bands are never commanded. We looked at the nine verses and they were singing and none of them were prayed. So they're never commanded. Secondly, worship amongst the saints is collective and individual. Now, understand what I'm saying when it's collective and individual. You and I will gather together as saints and we will go through those five acts of worship together, right? Are, are, we, are y'all awake? All right. We're going to go through those five actions of worship together. And I'm going to sit over here and Mark's going to sit right there. And I'm not going to do a thing. I'm not going to open my mouth. I'm not going to open the Bible. I'm not going to take any of the Lord's Supper. I'm not going to give my means. I'm not going to pray when the person prays. Does that mean Mark doesn't have to either? 
We do that as a group, but if no one in the group does it, I am still obligated individually to do it. What are you saying, preacher? Let's suppose that a, we find us a loophole where we can have ourselves a praise band. How many of you play instruments? All right, so we've got six, maybe, who can worship God. The rest of y'all are just out of luck. Remember, it is individual, so you're going to have to play too. It's collective and individual. If that is the worship, then everyone must take part in it. Notice this, the praise band is never even given by example. It can't, it's never commanded. It's never given by example. It doesn't fit into the collective and individual worship that God has for His people. And, just a fourth one, the word a cappella in 2020 means uh, without the accompaniment of music. That's a good definition for that particular word uh, in 2020. When that word was first penned, the word a cappella meant in the style of the church without the accompaniment of music. Hmm. Even our language says the church doesn't use praise bands and music. Even our common sense says the, the worship unto God in, in musical form is from us as a collective group and as an individual group. It's what is commanded. It's what is, uh, it's what is given by example. Why not have a praise band? Because it doesn't fit that criteria. It's never mentioned. God wants us to sing. with the intent of everything that we have, to give praise and honor unto the one who created us. Preacher, it sounds an awful lot like you hate music. You know, the one who was mentioned as being the man after God's own heart, you know what one of his favorite pastimes was? <laughs> Notice how I asked that question. You know what one of his favorite pastimes was? You know what I didn't ask? <laughs> what David did in worship. And you know why? For the Christian, underneath the Christian age, for us it doesn't really matter what the Old Testament did in worship. We're no longer obligated to that worship. Why not have a praise band? Because God doesn't want it. It all deals with authority. That's why we started where we did. That's why we looked at that as long as we did. And for this reason, am I looking at my life in the um, realm of worship and in the realm of the house and at the realm of everything else, am I living my total life underneath the authority of God? It is the case sometimes that people have tried to live lives underneath the authority of God while they're in places like this only to take that coat off as they walk out of that door, simply to put that coat back on when they walk in the door. You know what that's called? Lost. The Christian, the child of God, the one who is following in the patterned example of Jesus ought to be living that way. And every breath of Jesus' life while he was 
living on this earth in that physical body was to do the will of God. He was underneath that authority. Do you find yourself underneath that authority? The answer is no. Perhaps it's no because you've never put on Christ in baptism. That's a valid answer. I've never done what God wants me to do. Well, do that. Hear what he has to say, and believe it, John 8 and verse number 24. Repent of your sin, Luke 13, 3 and 5. Confess that Jesus is the Christ, John chapter 14 and verse 6. And be baptized in water for the remission of your sins, Acts 2, 38. Be raised to walk in a newness of life, Romans 6, 1 through 4. Be his child. According to Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, you then will be adopted into the family of God, being joint heirs with Jesus himself. But maybe that's not you. Maybe you have done that, but really when you look at yourself, you look and say, I really haven't lived under the authority of God. Maybe that's because you take your coat on and off. Be a Christian when you walk out there. Be a light when you walk out there. That's what he expects. That's what he wants. He wants us to be lights in a dark world. And maybe you haven't been doing that, but you can. You can change that tonight. Come back home to him. Give God what he wants and, and not what you want to give him. Give him what he wants. Right now, while we stand and sing. Christ, your broken life.